Amen. Well, if you would, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, beginning in verse 13. And let me give you kind of a little, oh, I don't know, heads up. Today, we are going to use our Bibles. Does that sound okay? Tyler says, I brought one. I'm good. I'm glad we brought a Bible. What do I mean by that? Of course, every Sunday we're in God's Word. But today, we will not be putting the text of the Scripture up on a screen. So if you have a device or an analog Bible, remember these, like leatherback with pages? Like, if you have one of those, we're going to be going through a handful of Scriptures today And would love for you to take your device or to take your Bible, your book, and to go to those scriptures with us. Now, I will be reading and teaching primarily out of the New Living Translation, which is a thought-for-thought translation. But as you saw in the video announcements, we're so excited for in two weeks to be stepping into the book of Philippians. Philippians. This is going to be the focus and the fixation of our hearts for the fall. On Sunday mornings, we plan in September, October, and November to navigate a verse-by-verse teaching series through the book of Philippians. And if I may have your attention, if I may see your eyes, it's because in the book of Philippians, you will have the opportunity To finally discover the key to joy. And it's Jesus. You know that. You learned that in preschool. Remember that? But see, life has a way of changing you, doesn't it? I spoke to a friend three days ago that I hadn't spoken to in nine years. And we shared this sentiment that, hey, even though we're the same people, same personality quirks and same hairline, unfortunately, but like, you know, same people... We're not the same. Experiences change a person. Death changes a person. When a family member passes on, life is forever different. You're constantly changing. You're constantly experiencing new people, new places, new experiences, new challenges, new joys, new sorrows. So I think I need, I think you need, I think we need something that's living and active to speak to us afresh. I'm so thankful that there is this thing known as a talking book, the Word of God, that it's living and active right where you are. And as you survey, just even think of today, when you hear about Christians baptizing, and as they're baptizing, they transition physically from earth to heaven. There's an element of sorrow for all of us. I heard it in the room as you hear of that. Think of where we are as a nation. Think of where we are environmentally. Think where we are in our health care. There is a proclivity, a possibility, dare I say a probability, that sorrow can grip your heart with where we've been, with where we are, perhaps with where we're headed. So what's the key? To joy. You know it. You know him. His name is Jesus. But as you navigate life, it is ever so easy to get one degree off and find, oh, well, my joy will be when this, is, when this situation comes, when this salary finally raises, when I finally get to this level in this business or in this endeavor, or I finally get that academic accomplishment checked. That's when it'll be. The dust never settles. So if you're not joyful now, why will you be joyful then? That's not even logical. And joy is a choice more than it is a reaction or finally an achievement. And I believe that the book of Philippians brings clarity to who we are in Christ, who we are in the church, who we are in the world, and how to have a settled, staying joy. I can't wait for that time in the book of Philippians. Pastor John and I have kind of scheduled out a potential preaching calendar where for the month of September, October, and November, we'll navigate that book together. And if you're in a sermon-based connect group, 
you'll be able to dialogue with that content. Because I'm hoping this one simple thing, that by the time we hit Thanksgiving, we'll at least see one more joyful person. If that's it, and that's just me. Like, if I get something out of it and you don't, okay, good. I'm just kidding. No, no, no. But, like, that's my goal. That's my heart. That's my intent. That you would see that Jesus is the key to your joy. And I will say this with, I think I can say this with humble confidence. You will have that opportunity. Whether or not you actualize it has everything to do with you. Your attitude. Your beliefs. Your choices your decisions, your engagements, your friends, your goals, your habits, your interests, the things you take joy in. Because you know as much about this as you want. And you experience as much of Him as you surrender to Him. I want the best for you. I want you to walk in joy. I think the book of Philippians will show us and share to us how to navigate that. But you say, but you said that starts in September. We're still in August. Don't you know where you are? I barely know where I am. I know that tomorrow is my son's sixth birthday, so I'm focused on that. Like little Liam, we're focused on that. But for this Sunday and for next Sunday, we're transitioning out of Psalmer time. Did you guys enjoy Psalmer time as a study? Yes, I thought it was great. Wonderful time in God's Word. We're transitioning into a season of connect groups. So we're spending this Sunday and next Sunday with this kind of title, uh, Connecting. There it is right there, Connect Together. So in Matthew chapter 5, let me read something to you that you might say, this is the text that you want to look at? Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13, if you're there, let me know by saying Jesus is Lord. Now, if you believe that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, there you go. All right. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, coming from the New Living Translation. This is what Jesus says. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It'll be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. You see, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Lord, as we open your word, we pray that you'd open our hearts. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Your salt and light, he says. The implication of that, the inference of that is, you know what? You're you're actually in the community. You're not constantly retreating from the world, but you're in the world. Not of the world, but you're connected enough to where you actually bring a little bit of tastiness to that dynamic, a little bit of light to that darkness, that you are connected, yes, to God, yes, to the church, but to a certain degree, You're in the world. There's actually people that you know that don't know Jesus. That can be, dare I say, that should be who you are as a Christian. Not not always in a holy huddle. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just retreating from the world. That place is gnarly. Listen, it's not supposed to be heaven till it's heaven. That's when heaven will be heaven when you're in heaven. See what I'm saying? Like, that's not going to be here. Here is opportunity to serve. Here is opportunity to live on mission. Here is opportunity to connect with those, listen, that have no way in the world to experience joy. No way in the world to experience lasting, staying peace. And no way possible to know what it's like to be loved completely. Without Christ, those are not on the table for you. If you have been changed by Jesus, you can't help but want others to be changed by Jesus. That's a true litmus test of a Christian. If you're like, well, I don't, then examine yourself, as 2 Corinthians would say. Why is that? Why don't you care? There's something wrong there. 
Perhaps you've bought into the American dynamic of churchianity, which is very different than Christianity. There's a form of it, but it has no power. You are the salt, you are the light. But I want to ask this question. What does that mean, that I should go get salty or I should go get, you know, light myself up? How, what does that mean? Like, how do I become salty? How, how do I become that light? Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. And then keep a finger in Genesis chapter 2. Not too far. Two always comes after one. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26, and then in a moment, we'll look at Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. But this dynamic that Jesus says, listen, as a believer, you're going to be light to the world, salt to the earth. Well, how? How does that happen? Genesis chapter 1, if you're there, let me know by saying, Jesus loves me. Okay, Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 26 through 31. Here we go, New Living Translation. God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth, the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God. He created them male and female, he created them. Make sure you know that Bible verse right there when people say, well, I, I determine what gender I am. I'm pretty sure right there that kind of explains that. But this is what he says, verse 28. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. I've been obedient to that. You know, we got six kids. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Verse 29, then God said, look. I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food, and I've given you every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry around the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Verse 31, God looked over all he had made and saw that it was very good. And evening passed and morning came, making it the sixth day. Connect together, salt and light. Why are we in the book of Genesis? This doesn't make any sense. You are hardwired for connection. Did you see what Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 says? Let us make man in our image. Who is he talking to? Is he talking to the angels? Is he talking to the birds? Is he talking to the worms? Who is he talking to? Let us create human beings in our image. God, by definition, is community. Father, Son, and Spirit. If God, by definition, is community, and he is your designer, which means you're not God, we don't really care what you think about everything. You're not God. We care what he thinks. I'm not the authority. You're not the authority. God is the authority. God is the creator. We are the created. God is the designer. We are the ones who are designed. You are created in his image. Then this is what that means by implication. You're designed for connection. It is not a sign of weakness for a male to say, you know what? I need to be honest and in relationship with another human being. For a spouse, a female, or with friends, with men. That's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of you finally understand your design. Now maybe you can be strong. But see, in, in this generation, perhaps previous generations, it was seen as like, well, the one in command is the one who's in demand. The one who really knows, man, he's John Wayne. He's out there like He's Lone Ranger with some kind of weird thing called Toto or something. You know what I mean? Like, that's, who, that's what a man is. No, it's not. A man is one who knows what toughness and tenderness is and is able to show both. That's what a man is. But that's who God is. So how does this relate to salt and light and connection? Listen to me. Hang with me. 
You're wired for connection. But in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, let me read it to you. Something happened. An amazing thing happened. God said it's not good for man to be alone. And every husband said, amen. okay, you're supposed to say amen. You might say, I don't agree. No, but you're supposed to say amen. That's, that's, that's a softball to kind of like let your wife go, oh, he loves me. Right? Let's try that again. It's not good for man to be alone. And every husband said, amen. okay, there you go, guys. Good job. But he said, I'll make a helper who is just right for him. Listen to that. It's not good for man to be alone. That's true both maritally and just in general community. Did you know that one of the cruelest forms of punishment a human being can inflict upon another human being is isolation? Isolation. You are not designed to be disconnected. You are designed, you are wired, you are formed and fashioned, you're created to connect. I think many of the problems in our society today has to do with this reality. People are not connected to God nor to others. Well, what does it mean to connect? Well, if you just look it up in the, de- like Webster's, you ever heard of that? Like the book, or just Google that, Webster's. It means to join, to link, to fasten together, to unite, or to bind. That there's a binding, there's a connection, there's a fastening. To what relationally? What should that look like? I think it should look like to God. Now, please hear me out on this. What should the connection look like? I think it should be a healthy connection to God, who you are, who others are in your family, in your church, and in your community. If a person doesn't see God accurately, themselves accurately, and others accurately, they will behave inaccurately. Scripture is not about behavioral modification. It's about a whole new life where you see things the way God sees them. Well, what does that look like to behave well with others? You know, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7, through 7, you don't have to turn there, but you can jot it down. The Apostle Paul lists the character qualifications that must be so in the leaders in the church. Let me just share some of them with you. In his relationship to his family, he's the husband of one wife, meaning he's a one-woman man. When speaking of a Christian leader... There must be submissive children. What does that mean? That they're perfect? Yes. If you don't have perfect pastor's kids in there, no. But there is this dynamic of, okay, there's health there. There's submission there. And that the individual can manage his family well. Why? Because I think good dads make good pastors. I think good husbands make good caretakers for God's people. Yet too much in this profession do we elevate the gift of communication over the demand of character. And that is why we are where we are with many of our spiritual leaders. We laud calculated communicators when what we really need is individuals of character. What his relationship to himself should be. Well, read 1 Timothy 3. They should be sober-minded. What does that mean? That they're not everywhere. That there's a sense of stability. They're self-controlled, not a drunkard, not a lover of money. What's the relationship to others? You're seeing like relationship to family, relationship to self. Well, they should be, when they're in the community, when there's a reputation, should be respectable, hospitable, not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, and well thought of by others. That's talking about non-Christians. Like when they think of that, hey, you know what? I don't agree with his opinion on like gender or morality or, but you know what? That's a good guy. I like that guy. That should be the reputation of a Christian leader. Why are you sharing this? Why does that matter? I think that should be the, like where we're all going. Don't we all kind of need a good relationship with family? <laughs> a good relationship to oneself? What do you mean? Like You've got some self-control. You're not a lover of money. You're sober-minded. And to relationship to others, that in the community you're actually seen as a benefit as salt and light. 
Not by all. Because if the world hated Jesus, trust me, the world's going to hate you. They're, don't misunderstand. Don't take it, the analogy too far. But listen, there should be this dynamic of Christians where there is health. There is health. Health in the relationship with God. Health in the relationship to oneself. Health in the relationship to others. In family, in the church, and in the community. That's what I would call, oh, that's a healthy connection. A healthy connection to God. A healthy understanding of who you are and who you're not. And a healthy understanding to others. Your family. Your church community. Your local community. Where does it come from? Teach me, O Jedi Master, how to learn to connect, right? Where? Take your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. I think the best person to learn from is Jesus. And when Jesus decided to change the world, if I can even use that phrase, or when Jesus was sent to start a whole new group of people, to usher in new life through his life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, what did he do? Mark chapter 3, look at verse 13. If you're there, let me know by saying Jesus is alive. Verse 13 from Mark chapter 3 Coming from the New Living Translation, this is what is said of Jesus. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him, and they came to him. Then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. I love this next phrase. They were to accompany him. New King James says, to be with him. And then he would send them out to preach, giving authority to cast out demons and do their ministry. But did you see the source? Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. He calls his disciples to him. Why? Well, the way the New Living Translation puts it, so they would accompany him. Other translations? So that they would be with him. Um, why do we connect? In our community, in our church, in our family. How, how, how should it be done? You know, I'm, I'm, I know you're using your Bibles a lot in church. I hope that's okay, but... Matthew chapter 22, turn there. The way these disciples were trained, the way these disciples were first brought into this understanding that they were to be the sent ones was to simply be with Jesus. And then I love what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22. If you wanted to give him a job description, if you wanted to give yourself a job description of how you can just like nail it in life, Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 34, the Pharisees are, are there, the Sadducees are there, and one of them's a, an expert in the law, it says in verse 35, they're trying to trap Jesus, and they ask him this question in verse 36, like, I know how I'll get you, I'm going to ask you what the greatest commandment is, there's 613, what do you say about that, Jesus? And Jesus, as he would ever so do so masterfully, not only would he necessarily kind of answer the question in the way that they didn't think, but he turned the question or add to his answer, which just blew their mind. Verse 37, Jesus said, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. This is the great commandment. And the one asking the question would go, All right, you got it, Jesus. The Shema of Deuteronomy, you nailed it. And then this is what Jesus does. And the second is equally important. No one was expecting that. I just asked you kind of a pop quiz, like Jesus, do you know? What are you about to say? The second, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Listen, I only know what it's like to be me. I know what it's like to be a white Caucasian male 
in the 20th, 21st century growing up in Northwest Florida. I know what life is like that. I know what that's like. I have no idea what's it, what it's like to grow up in Haiti. I have no idea what it's like to grow up in Compton. I have no idea what it's like to grow up in a non-nuclear family. I don't know what that's like. I can read about it. I can meet other people. I can learn. But if I dare to assume that I know every single challenge that you've had because of the color of your skin or because of where you're from or because of the religious or cultural influences of your life, I don't love you at all. I only see my life through my lens. We must understand, you're not God. I'm not God. I don't have an angle on everything in life. I only can see through where I'm from, what I've done, where I've been. And we have that in common. So what's the way forward? How do we connect? How can we be salt? How can we be light? Let me share with you an acronym that I recently developed when asked this question from a cohort that I'm in. I think we need more leaders. What do you mean by that? Like strong-arm people that are going to take us from A to B? Let me spell this out for you. L-E-A-D-E-R. We need more men and women who know how to love. What does that look like? It looks like letter E. Extreme views with empathy. A leader who does not have extreme views is not a leader. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Can I have your attention? Can I see your eyes? That's extreme. That, that's saying that there's no other way. That's extreme. But a leader who does not know how to EQ his IQ will not go far. A leader who does not have empathy. A leader who does not say, listen, I don't know what it's like to sit in your sandals, to be where you're from, to know how you think. If a generation doesn't know how to be empathetic with the next generation, no wonder there's disconnect. You didn't grow up in the digital era. You didn't grow up in the analog era. You're not going to necessarily always understand each other. There must be extreme views with empathy if you want to connect. There must be love. Why should there be love? Jesus says right here, if you want to hang everything the Bible says, love God and love others. Well, what's the A? If it's love and it's extreme views with empathy, here it is. We could do with a little bit more genuine acquisition or just questions. Like when you meet someone that you're disconnected with, ask. Talk to them. Engage with them. Find out why they think the way that they think. Ask and acquire information. I'll never forget one of the guys that trained me. He said, Neil, you know, I found it so interesting. I I would listen to my circle of friends, be it in theology or whatever. Let's just use the example of Chick-fil-A and KFC. Hypothetical situation. And I would listen to all my KFC boys, and they'd say, oh, Chick-fil-A, their sandwich is terrible. Have you tried our sandwich? It's awesome. You know, at Chick-fil-A, they put this kind of sauce in their chicken, and it's terrible. It's tasteless. You would never want it. And he said, and I was listening to all my KFC friends. I thought, well, I guess that's the way Chick-fil-A is. And then he said, one day, I went into Chick-fil-A, and I realized that none of my KFC friends had ever been there. And yet they were the authority on what Chick-fil-A is. Now, this is a silly illustration. But don't denominations do this? Don't ethnicities do this? Don't political parties do this? Talk to people. Stop talking about people. Stop picking on people and start picking from people. Say, what do you mean? You are not the authority. As soon as you learn the authority structure in your life, then things will align. Who's the authority? God. God, that's the first connection that you have to get right. If you don't get that connection right, everything else is haywire. Why is it wrong to sleep with another human being sexually before marriage? Because this says so, 
And this is God's word, and God's word is God's enablements to a healthy life, and God's words are God's standards. That's why. It's not my opinion. It's not your mama's opinion. It may be, but it's also God's standard. Does that make sense? God's commandments are God's enablements. And listen, this is what I need to say. We need more leaders, people that love, people that have extreme views with empathy, people that will actually ask questions and say, is that really what Chick-fil-A believes? Let me go talk to them. Now, how do you check it out? Well, I had one friend who was an apologetics teacher, and he said this about bad theology. Neil, you must study bad theology as a doctor studies disease. What does that mean? He doesn't just jump into the disease saying, okay, let me learn about HIV. No, 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 no. There's sanitation, there's the right gloves, there's the right everything that you wear. And with bad thinking, you must separate your mind, or basically solidify your mind with God's truth. You don't immerse yourself in the muck and say, well, I'm just trying to learn. No, 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 have wisdom. But there must be that acquisition, that ask. You love, you lead with empathy. There's questions, and then the D. Discover, discern, develop, deploy. Lead by example. And remember that it's all about relationship. We could do with more leaders in the home, in the church, and in the community. You can love. You can be someone who has extreme views with empathy. Well, I don't have extreme views. If you believe in Jesus, you have an extreme view. You can ask questions. You can learn to develop a plan or develop and discover As you ask those questions, you can be one who leads by example. And remember that it's not about winning an argument, it's about winning a person. Because sometimes you can be so right and so wrong in your right, if that makes any sense. Because you don't know how to EQ your IQ. The ones that EQ their IQ are GQ, that's what I say. You see what I mean there? Like they're the ones that got it. Now how do we connect? This is where we're going to land the plane, this is where we'll end our time this morning. I believe we're called to connect first and foremost to God and then to others, then to the home, then to the church, then to the community, then to the world. Well, how does that work? You, if you've been around here for five minutes, you might know that I'm a fan of alliteration, right? I have six children. They all begin with the letter L. I'm going to share with you an opinion of a way I think you could live not just the good life, but the God life. And believe it or not, everything I'm about to say say starts with the letter G. Here it is. How? How do I connect with God? Here's the first four Gs. Like connect four, right? That's how you connect. Glory, gospel, grow, and gone. Say, What do you mean by that? Everyone lives for greatness, for themselves, for their organization, for their family, for their team, for whatever, and that's not wrong. Listen to me. Let me have your attention. Let me have your eyes. We're almost done. You're designed for connection, but you're also designed for glory. The Westminster Catechism, the shorter, this is what it says. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. You are designed for glory. Glorious purpose. That's your calling. But whose glory? Not yours. Not the Miami Dolphins. Not LSU, right? I mean, God bless those people. But like, that's not what we're about. We're not the church of sport. We're the church of the Savior, Jesus Christ. And you are designed to live For his glory. How? Gospel. Gospel. Until you understand who you are and who he is and what he's done on your behalf, you will always be seeking, searching, going after some lesser God. Here's more alliteration for you. Salary, status, sex, substance, situation, stuff, or sport are good things that are not meant to be God things. But when you make a good thing a God thing, it robs the good thing of the thing that God intended it for. And you're living for something less. You're not meant to live for those seven slippery distractions of the serpent. Salary, status, sex, substance, situation, stuff, or sport. You're designed to live for a Savior. 
That's who you're designed for, right where you are. Mission is not over there. Mission is right here and everywhere he places you. Everywhere he places you. So how do I have a healthy connection to God? Glory and gospel. You live for his glory. How? How do I get there? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Repent of your sins. Place your faith in Jesus. Why? Because God so loved you that he gave his one and only begotten son. And if you would simply believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have everlasting life. You say, what does it mean to believe? This is what it means to believe. I'm putting the full weight of my life into what Jesus has done. It's not an academic inclination. It's the full weight of my life is upon Jesus. That's what belief is. Belief that Jesus saves does not save you. Belief in Jesus, that's what saves you. I believe that Jesus is God. Good for you. Jesus' brother James says, so does the demons. I don't know if we're going to see any demons in heaven. But belief in Jesus, hey, my full life is in Jesus. Ah, that's salvation. That's salvation. And that will be evidenced through your attitudes, through your choices, through your beliefs, through your decisions. I don't think there is such a thing as a closet Christian because your attitude shows what you believe. Your choices over time, it evidences what you believe. Your money evidences what you believe. It's not that hard to figure out over time. So how do I have that healthy connection to God? Glory. Not mine. His. Gospel. Well, then what do I do? Well, you need to grow. And Christians don't grow day by day. They grow word by word. I get into his word. I share my faith with others. And I submit to his lordship. If you want to know the fastest way to grow, here it is. Just get out of the driver's seat. Learn God's word and serve people. It's not just Jesus take the wheel, but it's like Jesus take the keys. Like that's, that's how it goes. Like it's your car now, whatever you say. That's where you begin to grow. And then you remember this. This is a life challenge. At least it is for me at the age of 39. I live with a gone mentality. What's a gone mentality? It's Colossians chapter 3. I died. My life is no longer my own. My life is in Christ. What he says is what I say. What he does is what I do. I own nothing. I steward everything. I'm gone. Does that make sense? You want a healthy connection to God? Here it is. Four simple G's. Glory, gospel, growth, and gone. But here's the beautiful thing about a cross. You can't have a cross with just a single beam. There's the vertical beam. That's the relationship to God. Glory, gospel, growth, gone. What's the horizontal? What does life look like to others, to your family, to your community, to your world? Three other simple G's. Gather, group, go. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 2, and this will be the last passage we look at this morning, and then we're going to wrap up. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse, oh, 41. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. This is the doctor, the physician, Luke, giving us an account of the work of the Holy Spirit in the initial church. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. If you're there, let me know by saying, I love Jesus. It says that those who believed what Peter had said, because he just gave an amazing sermon, they were baptized. And that day, the church grew about 3,000. This right here dispels that dynamic where you say, well, I want to be a part of a church where I know everybody. Listen, the purpose of a church is not that everybody knows everybody. The purpose of the church is that everybody is known, that you're actually in a community. 3,000 people joined the church that day. Does that mean, oh no, it's one of those big mega churches. Those things are of the devil. No, what are you crazy? Like, do you see what happened here? It's not that everybody knows everybody and that's the epitome of a local church. It's that everybody is known. Listen, I've been a part of small churches. 
I've been a part of churches where there's 50 people. I'm telling you, not everybody knows everybody. They know their own people, and they're like, oh, yeah, I kind of know Jim, and, but whatever, I'm right here in my circle. That's not the purpose of a church. The purpose of a church is that everyone is known. Well, how do I do that? Well, keep reading. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, and the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper and a prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous and signs. There's life happening there. And all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything. There's kindness there. There's love there. And they sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. There's giving there. And they worshiped together at the temple each day and met in homes and shared their meals with great joy and generosity and all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord was their church growth marketing plan. He's the one that added to the fellowship daily who was being saved. Gather, group, and go. If you've been a part of this fellowship for any length of time, you know our mission statement. We're here to love God. We're here to connect together. We're here to live on mission. But what's the active word for that? We gather on Sunday mornings to love and worship God. Did you know that this gathering, although it benefits you, is actually not for you? This is revolutionary for American Christians because most people like battle each other. Christians, I know, I grew up in church. It's like this is the question. Well, Sunday morning, is it for the disciple or is it for the lost person? Neither. It's for God. This is a worship gathering. Not a gathering to make sure you get the ministry you want. I don't know where that is in here. But it's a gathering for God. But listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. But it benefits you immensely if your heart and head and hands are right. Like, I don't know about you, but when I gather with God's people to sing, to learn, to pray, to give, to fellowship, I like that. That's like awesome sauce. Like, that's what I'm designed for. I benefit from that. But it's not for me. It's for God. No wonder you don't like church. You thought it was for you. It's actually for God. You benefit from it. Don't misunderstand me. Now, what about grouping together? See, did you see that there in Acts? There in the temple, there's like monologue, there's preaching. But I think that you need to be in a group where you're known. I don't think you will grow in the way you're designed. And you could grow unless you get into a committed group where you're actually known. It takes time. It takes trust. It takes consistency. But you gather to love and adore and worship God. You group to connect and to support and to encourage and to pray and to love one another. And then the last thing I would say, how do you keep a healthy connection to God's people? The community you're in, the world you're in, you go to live on mission. Someone once told me this, Neil, Christians are like manure. Perhaps you've heard this. You say, well, that's kind of rude. Well, this is what he said. You just keep them together all the time, and it starts to stink. But you spread them out like fertilizer, and there's growth. Amen. See, that guy likes it. Like, when you go to live on mission, that's when life starts to get fun. Where you start to say, now, not only, it's not, nothing's about me. Like, it's all about him. And it's about them. And that's how you win. When it's about him and about them, that's how you win. Connecting together. Next Sunday, Pastor John's going to share a second part to this message about connection. Why are we doing this? If I can have your attention, if I can see your eyes. Because I want you to do well. I want you to run your race well. Not to be caught up in the trap of comparison or the trap of shoulda, woulda, coulda, but you're alive now. Let the past be past, live in the moment, and trust, the God, trust God with the future. And I'm telling you, glory, gospel, growth, gone, that's the vertical. You're never going to graduate from that. It's like, oh, I got it. Now I don't have to worry about my relationship with God. Puh, you're in big trouble than you think. Like, you've got to always be like, available to God. But then secondarily, gather, group, go. It's like, take those seven and call me in the morning. You know what I mean? It's like that kind of concept. Like, this is it. This is the prescription for a healthy, balanced life. 
You're living countercultural. You're living cross centered. And you'll be able to answer this question appropriately Are you free? A free person doesn't need more information of what that means. You say, yeah, I know, I am free. But if I share those three words to you in the interrogative sense as a question, are you free? And you go, well, then you're not. You don't know what it's like to be free in Christ. And you can. You can. It's what he died for. That you'd be free from the opinions of others. You'd be free from trying to fulfill something, define your identity or your worth or your value. You are already valued. In the Song of Solomon, the author writes this phrase, and this is where I'll end. You are all fair, my love. There's no spot in you. Don't you know that that's how God sees you because you're robed in the righteousness of Christ. You don't have to prove your worth to Jesus. He loves you just like you are. He don't want you to stay that way. He loves you so much, He wants more for you. But you don't work for His favor. You live because you have it. And you're free. Glory, gospel. Growth, gone. Gather, group, go. This isn't just the good life. This is the best life you could ever live. Doesn't matter how smart you are, how much money you've got, you can do those things. Doesn't matter how old or how young you are, you can do those things. Let's stand together. I'm going to ask you to grab your communion packet. The worship team's going to come and just share a brief song so we can prepare our hearts. But this is the one that gives us power for life and godliness it's Christ. And so at least once a month, we gather together as a church in this setting to share communion together. And in these apparatuses, it's very important that you don't take the lid off with the liquid facing down. That'll really not go well for you. But if you keep the liquid up and then the bread down, I'm going to encourage you as we sing this song to go ahead and remove the element of bread and open the element for the juice. And after we've all been prepared, Pastor John is going to come and lead us in communion. Father, I thank you for this time together. I pray, Lord, that we would connect well to you and to others and that this time of communion would be blessed. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.